Hello, Naomi, Nicholas greeted, meeting an elderly woman in a robe and apron, lightly dusted with flour, at the doorstep of the apartment. Hello, Nicholas. How are you? She kindly replied, noticing Zoe shyly hiding behind her. I'm good. I thought I'd bake an apple pie. Come in with Zoe later. I'll treat you, she graciously offered. I'd love to, but I have to leave for a flight in a few hours. Could you look after Zoe while I'm away? Nicholas asked politely, fearing she might refuse. You know I'm always happy to help. My kids live in another city and rarely visit with the grandkids. And Zoe is almost like family to me, the grandmother agreed joyfully, understanding Nicholas's responsibilities as a single father. All right. Thank you very much. Here's some money so you and Zoe won't need anything, he replied, handing her a few bills. Despite the awkwardness, she didn't refuse. Her pension was small, and it was hard to make ends meet alone, let alone with any additional expenses, even if just for a few days. Dad, will you buy me a toy? Zoe, with her blue eyes and curly hair, asked, looking at her father. Of course, sweetheart. Nicholas replied with a smile, knowing he couldn't refuse his adorable daughter. And come back soon. Zoe added. Don't worry, I'll be back in three days, I promise. We'll go to the amusement park right away, he reassured her, hugging her tightly. Zoe, will you help me with the pie while Dad gets ready for his trip? Naomi asked, understanding Nicholas needed some free time to pack and prepare. Yes, gladly, the little girl replied happily, who loved cooking with her grandmother. She didn't know much but she simply enjoyed watching simple ingredients turn into culinary masterpieces. Great. Now, kiss Dad and let's go to the kitchen, Naomi added, leaving the apartment door slightly ajar as she hurried to the oven. Dad, I love you very much. Zoe said, almost tearing up, and hugged him tightly around the neck. I love you too, my princess. Behave well so I don't have to blush in front of Naomi, okay? And I promise I'll buy you a toy for it, Nicholas replied, motivating his daughter to be obedient. Okay, the little girl replied, not letting go of her father. Realizing it was time to leave, Zoe hurried after Naomi, already smelling the pleasant aroma of ripe apples from the kitchen. Meanwhile, Nicholas, knowing his child was in good hands and he had nothing to worry about, hurried home. After packing everything necessary for the three-day trip, he headed to the loading point where his partner was already waiting. Stepping outside, Nicholas realized he had chosen the wrong clothes as the frost literally enveloped him, making him shiver from the cold. Glancing at his watch, he realized there was no time to go back home. So he got into the car and hurried to his partner. Nicholas had been a truck driver for 10 years, but every departure was a small ordeal for him as he had to leave his family without supervision. After his spouse passed away, leaving was even harder. But he managed to adapt, thanks to the attentive and loving neighbor, always ready to help and look after Zoe. Hey, how's everything here? All good? Nicholas asked his partner as they arrived at the loading base. Hey. Yeah, everything's fine. We're already loaded, so we'll be leaving soon. I've checked the route. We should manage it in three days, Dylan replied. What are we hauling this time? Household appliances. Mostly mobile phones, but there are also microwaves, a few refrigerators, and gas stoves. Got it. Great, Nicholas replied, throwing his stuff into the cabin and heading to the trailer with the cargo to inspect it before hitting the road. The next few days, the partners spent on the road. Knowing their children were waiting for them at home, they decided to save time and not stop at a hotel, sleeping in the truck instead. 
After unloading the goods, almost without rest, they headed back, hoping to see their families as soon as possible. Amidst all the hustle, Nicholas completely forgot about his promise to buy his daughter a toy, as he was only thinking about returning home as quickly as possible. On the way, just about three hours from his hometown, Nicholas received a phone call. Hi, Daddy. How are you? His daughter called him. Hi, my good girl. Uncle Dylan and I have already finished up and are heading back home. I hope to be there by evening. How are you doing? Behaving for Naomi? I hope I won't have to blush in front of her. No, I've been good. We cleaned all day yesterday, and today we're preparing dinner. I helped with pancakes, and I also washed the vegetables for the salad, his daughter proudly replied, knowing her dad would be thrilled with her efforts to act older than she really was. You're my smart girl. So, my promises stand, and tomorrow we're going to the amusement park. Wow, that's great. And did you already buy me a toy? She asked, reminding him of another promise. Nicholas always brought back a small, inexpensive gift from each trip, which she kept in a special toy chest. Yes, of course. I think you'll like this one, Nicholas lied, remembering that he had completely forgotten about this promise. After chatting a bit more and promising to arrive just in time for dinner, he realized he needed to rectify the situation as soon as possible to avoid looking foolish in his daughter's eyes and disappointing her. You know, I promised to buy a toy and forgot all about it. Nicholas said to his partner, realizing it was getting dark and he probably wouldn't be able to find a gift along the way. Well, it's not the end of the world. Let's solve this. In about half an hour, we'll be passing through a small village where I've seen some shops and a makeshift market. I'm sure we'll find something suitable there. I've bought toys there myself, and the kids were always happy, Dylan reassured his partner. A few minutes later, they indeed noticed a small village on the way that Dylan had mentioned. It seemed like a tiny oasis of life amidst the highway, as there were people, shops, and indeed, a small market. Pulling over not far from the road where some elderly women were sitting, Nicholas hurried over to them to find out where to buy a gift for his little daughter. Hello, could you please tell me where I can find a toy store? He asked politely. Hello, son. The store closed a couple of weeks ago. The owner moved to the city. One of the women replied. Oh my. What should I do now? Nicholas muttered, realizing he simply wouldn't have another chance to find a gift. Victoria usually deals with toys now. You could ask her. Maybe you'll find something there. Where can I find her? She didn't seem to be trading today. She mentioned she wasn't feeling well yesterday, probably stayed home. One of the vendors chimed in. Right, I see. Well, then you'll have to go to her house. Where does she live? Nicholas asked, glancing at his watch. On the next street, third house from the intersection. You'll recognize it right away, fallen fence, and it's the only one like that. The woman explained where to find Victoria. All right, thank you very much, the truck driver replied and, hastily returning to the truck, set off to search. The neighboring street turned out to be quite narrow, so he had to leave the car with his partner and set out on foot to find the right house. After just a hundred meters, Nicholas noticed a faded and partially rusty fence lying on the snow-covered ground. Looking up a bit higher, he saw a small house with a roof made of old, hail-damaged slate, which more resembled a creepy house on chicken legs from the fairy tales he used to read to his daughter at night. The appearance of the dwelling didn't inspire confidence, as it seemed like nobody could live there, and the building itself had long been abandoned. Victoria? Victoria? Nicholas called softly, knocking on the nearest window. 
Who's there? A grandmother asked suspiciously, opening the wooden door a minute later and peering out onto the street. Hello, sorry to bother you. I was told you sell toys, and I was hoping to buy a gift for my daughter, Nicholas said apologetically. Come back tomorrow. I'm not working today, the elderly hostess replied, coughing slightly, her condition clearly not the best. I'm sorry, but I'm just passing through. I'm returning from a business trip, and I promised Zoe a gift. I can't go home empty-handed, or she'll cry, Nicholas pleaded, trying to persuade her to spare him a couple of minutes of her time. Fine, come in, she replied, opening the door wide. Nicholas hurried inside and paused for a moment, feeling even more frightened. From the outside, the house seemed gloomy, but inside the situation was even worse. The half-naked walls with peeling, slightly yellowed wallpaper, the old, partially rotten floor with bowls and buckets collecting melting water dripping through the roof cracks. Victoria herself looked only slightly better than her dwelling. Visually, she seemed to be just over 60, but a holy woolen scarf and gray hair made her look even older in Nicholas's eyes. Choose, this is all I have right now, she added, pointing to several handmade dolls sitting on the edge of the couch. Examining each of them, Nicholas was struck by the talent of the village resident. Despite the oppressive atmosphere, the toys were bright, colorful, and cheerful. Each one seemed alive, with beautiful eyes and a childlike face. Carefully considering all the options, Nicholas immediately noticed one of the dolls, a small blue-eyed one with light hair, sitting in a pink dress with white lace, reminded him of his own daughter. This one, very beautiful. Nicholas said, pointing to the doll in the pink dress. Take it, the hostess replied calmly, naming the cost of the toy. Taking the money, she escorted her guest to the door and offered to come back if Zoe liked the gift. Thank you very much, and get well soon, Nicholas said as he bid farewell. And realizing he was a bit behind schedule, he hurried back to the car. Wow, looks like you managed to find her after all. Dylan remarked, seeing the toy in his friend's hands. Yes, look at this beauty. Nicholas boasted, responding. I think Zoe will love her. They even resemble each other, he added, confirming Nicholas's suspicions. Realizing time was passing and they were a bit off schedule, Nicholas stepped on the gas, barely staying within the speed limit. Arriving in town right on schedule, he realized there was no time to unload the truck full of construction materials this time so he suggested postponing it until the next day. After dropping off his partner at home, Nicholas headed to the neighbor's house to see and hug his beloved daughter. Hello. This is for you. Nicholas handed Naomi a cake he bought at a nearby store. Hi, Nicholas. Come in. We were just waiting for you. My hands are full, so hurry to the kitchen, the neighbor replied. While he went to the bathroom, she rushed to the girl to cut the treat. Hi, Dad. Zoe exclaimed joyfully, seeing her father in the kitchen. Jumping off the table, she ran to him and practically leaped, hugging him tightly. Hello, my dear. Look what I have for you, Nicholas replied, pulling a doll from behind his back. Wow, she's so beautiful. Just like me. The little girl exclaimed, taking the gift in her hands. Carefully examining it, the girl was impressed by how much the toy resembled her, both in the eyes and the hair color. Do you like it? Did Dad get the right gift? Naomi asked. Yes, very much. This is the best gift. Zoe replied, her eyes sparkling with happiness. Throughout dinner, she didn't let go of the doll for a moment, playing with it and closely examining the gift. Zoe literally forgot that she needed to eat. Only Dad and Naomi managed to remind her about dinner and the pancakes she had cooked with the neighbor. After a quick snack, 
She hopped off the chair and ran to her room to play with the doll and introduce her to other toys, often left by the neighbor for her to play with, so she would have something to play with not only at home, but also here. She's wonderful, Naomi remarked as soon as Zoe ran off. Yes, she's my only hope for the future. The only reason to smile and keep living, Nicholas sighed in response. You should find a good wife, and Zoe could use a mother. You're still young, and quite a handsome man. Wouldn't you look for someone, the neighbor added, realizing that Nicholas was only 35 and had his whole life ahead of him. No, I'm not ready for that. I don't want to get into a relationship knowing I won't fully commit to it. I live only for Zoe, she's the meaning of my life. I doubt I could get used to someone else and let them into my heart. Besides, Chloe still lives there. You just can't find another one like her, Nicholas replied, barely holding back a manly tear. After a little more time spent visiting, father and daughter returned home. Soon, Nicholas tried to put Zoe to bed and read her a bedtime story. Holding the doll tightly, the little girl hugged it and soon fell asleep. Carefully closing the door to his daughter's bedroom, Nicholas went to the kitchen to have a cup of coffee. Thinking about the correctness of his decision and remembering Chloe, he opened the window to smoke. Memories varied from the most tender and pleasant to the most painful. It seemed like it all happened just yesterday. Nicholas still remembered their first meeting and getting to know Chloe, every detail of that day that changed his whole life. A little over 12 years ago, Nicholas, a young man who had just finished vocational school and couldn't find a job, was helped by his mother, who worked as a cook in the dining hall of an orphanage, to get a job as an electrician. On his first day of work, Nicholas was very nervous. Arriving at the orphanage early in the morning, he immediately went to meet the director. She, assigning him his first task, sent the young man to the main building, where he had to fix several sockets. Oh, sorry. I didn't see you. Nicholas apologetically said, bumping into a young blonde girl who almost fell to the floor from the sudden collision. It's okay. Everything's fine. Are you fixing something here? She asked, smiling at the young man. Yes, I was told the sockets aren't working. I'm just checking, Nicholas replied, embarrassed, carefully examining the charming stranger in a soft blue dress and blue shoes. Her outfit perfectly matched her sky blue eyes, and the guy fell in love with her like a little boy. I see. Then I won't bother you. Would you like some tea? I can ask for it in the kitchen, she kindly offered. Yes, that would be very helpful, Nicholas replied. Blushing slightly, she hurried off and returned a few minutes later, carrying a cup of hot tea. Nicholas, taking it, felt his hands trembling. It seemed like he was sick and had a fever. But he realized that it was just an overflow of emotions he felt towards the charming and sweet girl. Forgive me for my boldness, but I'd like to get to know you. My name is Nicholas, and yours? Chloe, she replied, lowering her eyes, becoming even more flustered. You, Chloe, you're very beautiful. I've never met girls like you. Nicholas struggled to squeeze out a compliment. Thank you, it's very kind, she replied, feeling her cheeks flush with embarrassment, which seemed to consume him from within. For the next few minutes, they stood there without saying a word. They simply enjoyed each other's company, and words seemed unnecessary in this situation. A few days later, Nicholas found himself at the orphanage again and got to know Chloe better. Approaching her 18th birthday, she was getting ready for graduation. And understanding all this, Nicholas invited her to the ball. Chloe, feeling very shy, didn't refuse. After just two encounters, she had come to realize that their feelings were mutual. Just a few meetings changed their lives forever. 
After Chloe left the orphanage and celebrated her 18th birthday, the couple began dating. Two years later, they legalized their relationship, becoming husband and wife. It seemed like they were on cloud nine, being with someone each of them was ready to spend their whole life with. These warm and pleasant memories pierced Nicholas's mind. And he, not thinking about anyone other than his late wife, didn't notice that several hours had passed. Realizing it was already late enough, he hurried to the bedroom. On the way, Nicholas peeked into Zoe's room once again to make sure the little girl was asleep. Holding back tears, he looked at Zoe with sympathy, knowing she had to live without her mother. The event that took place two years ago was painful for both him and his daughter. Chloe was still very young, but one unfortunate accident changed everything. The next morning, Nicholas woke up a little earlier than usual. After taking a shower and having breakfast, he woke up his daughter and warned her that he would be away for a few hours to deal with the cargo and meet Uncle Dylan at work. Informing Naomi about it and asking her to watch Zoe, Nicholas hurried off. So, how did everything go yesterday? Is Zoe happy? His colleague asked as the loaders unloaded the goods. Yes, very. I didn't expect that this toy could make her so happy, Nicholas replied with inspiration. You see, I told you it's a good village. I've taken toys for my kids from there myself, and they've always been happy. Yeah, thanks. Really, you helped out. If it weren't for that woman with handmade dolls, I don't even know how I would have come home and looked Zoe in the eyes. She expects a little gift from me every time, after all. I understand. The main thing is, you pleased her. Now you can sleep with a clear conscience. Dylan replied with a smile. Yeah, that's good, of course, but you know, I'm so tired of these constant business trips. Zoe hardly sees me, and I'm barely involved in her upbringing. Over the years, Naomi has probably become closer to her than I am. Come on, don't make things up. She's little, but she knows perfectly well that money doesn't grow on trees. You're doing everything possible for her, providing everything she needs, and doing it alone isn't easy. Yeah, I know, I know. But I really miss my old life. After all, Naomi isn't Zoe's real grandmother just a neighbor. She can't replace her family. But you don't have another choice. Unfortunately, you don't have parents, just like Chloe. And who and where her parents are is a mystery, Dylan replied, trying to support his friend, knowing that his wife grew up in an orphanage and had no information about her relatives. Yeah, I would like to find them, but it's impossible. Chloe tried to find her mother once, but it didn't work out. Well, yes, it's difficult, even too difficult. Okay, let's not talk about sad things. Because when I remember that I have to go on another business trip in a week, it makes me feel sick. Okay, let's do it. How about coming over to my place for dinner tonight? My wife will cook something delicious, Dylan suggested, inviting his friend over. No, we have other plans for today. Promised my daughter a trip to the amusement park, so I have to keep my word, replied Nicholas. I see. Well, have a good evening. And if plans change, give me a call. You know, my wife is always happy to see you guys. All right, agreed, Nicholas replied and went back to work. Having finished all his tasks slightly earlier than usual, he hurried home. To his disappointment, Zoe had a fever. Not willing to risk his daughter's health, he had to postpone the promised outing for a few days. While Naomi stayed to look after their daughter, Nicholas rushed to the pharmacy and bought everything that could help his daughter, from medicinal tea to cough drops and antibiotics. Dad, are we going for a walk today? I'm feeling much better, Zoe said a few days later, feeling that the illness had passed. 
We'll check your temperature first. And if everything's okay, then we'll go, replied her father, wanting to make sure once again that she had recovered. Understanding that Zoe was feeling better and needed fresh air, Nicholas nodded approvingly, allowing the little girl to get ready for the walk half an hour later, they were out on the street. Are you sure you're not cold? Nicholas asked, adjusting his daughter's hat. No, I'm fine, she replied, not trying to hide her joyful smile because they were finally going to the park. Just ten minutes after leaving the house, Zoe's mood suddenly changed. She began to stop and tug at her father's hand, barely holding back tears. What's wrong? Why are you crying? Nicholas asked, noticing his daughter's reddened eyes and tears streaming down her cheeks. We forgot Sophie at home. We need to go back, Zoe said. Sophie? Which Sophie? Nicholas asked with a puzzled expression, trying to understand who she was talking about. Well, the doll you gave me. I don't want to go to the park without her, the girl replied, explaining the sudden change in mood. Well, if we need to go back, let's go, so Sophie won't be upset with us. Nicholas smiled, liking his daughter's attachment to his last gift. Back home. Without even taking off her shoes, the little girl ran to the kitchen and grabbed the doll sitting on the windowsill next to her chair. Realizing that the problem was successfully solved, they headed to the park, where they had a great time. The children's rides lifted Zoe's spirits, and the doll in her arms only contributed to that. Good evening, Nicholas. How's Zoe feeling better? Naomi asked, coming over. Hello. Yes, she seems noticeably better. We even went for a walk in the park today. Nicholas replied. That's wonderful. I brought Zoe some delicious cherry jam for tea to strengthen her immune system, the neighbor kindly replied, producing the gift from behind her back. Great, come in, have a seat. Let's have some tea together, Nicholas offered inviting her into the kitchen. No, no, I can't. My favorite show is starting now. I don't want to miss it. I understand. A TV show is sacred. Nicholas smiled and, taking the jar, hurried to the kitchen. Zoe, would you like some tea with cherry jam? I'm coming, the little girl shouted happily and, grabbing her doll, rushed to her father. Five minutes and everything will be ready, he said, putting the kettle on. Okay, Zoe said, not taking her eyes off Sophie. Wait here, I'll be right back, her father warned, stepping out for a couple of minutes to another room. Returning, Nicholas was horrified to see that his daughter had accidentally knocked over the jar of jam, splattering the table, floor, and her beloved toy. Dad, look what happened to my doll. Zoe said, showing Sophie, whose pink and white dress had turned dark cherry. Well, no big deal. We'll clean it up, and the dress can be washed, her father reassured her, realizing that his daughter was on the verge of tears. Will you help me wash it? she asked, hopefully looking into her dad's eyes. Of course. Let's go. I'll prepare everything, Nicholas replied and, heading to the bathroom first, filled a bowl with warm water, prepared detergent and soap. Can you manage or do you need help? No, I want to do it myself, confidently replied the daughter. All right then. I'll clean up in the kitchen and come back to you. Hurriedly getting things sorted, Nicholas wiped the messy table and carefully cleaned the floor to remove the sweet jam. Hearing his daughter splashing in the bowl of water, he felt joy and pride, knowing that he had a small but already quite grown-up and independent daughter. Ten minutes later, Nicholas returned to the bathroom, where Zoe was washing the doll's dress and was almost taken aback to see it. On the back of the dress, 
he noticed a beautifully embroidered four-leaf clover, next to which were two large letters, V and A. Examining them closely, he was literally stunned, not noticing how time passed and what was happening around him. Dad, are you okay? Zoe asked, bringing him back to reality. Oh, nothing, everything's fine. So? Is everything washed? Nicholas asked, taking the handmade dress and rinsing it in soapy water again. Finishing the washing, he helped his daughter hang it on the laundry line in the bathroom. There, it'll be dry and clean by tomorrow morning, added the father, reassuring Zoe. Thank you, Dad, she replied gratefully and hugged him tightly. Grabbing her doll, the little girl ran to her bedroom to play with her a little more before bedtime. A bit later, Nicholas joined his daughter, tucked her into bed, read a bedtime story as usual. And as soon as she fell asleep, Nicholas quietly left her room and went to his own. Opening the drawer of the dresser, where his late wife's things were kept, he took out a small piece of fabric and went to the bathroom. This can't be. Nicholas muttered in shock pressing the piece of fabric against the doll's dress and noticing that the patterns and initials on them were identical. In that moment, he froze, not understanding how this could be possible. Thousands of thoughts, hundreds of assumptions and inversions swirled in his head, all trying to logically explain this. Feeling that he wouldn't be able to sleep without finding explanations, Nicholas went to the kitchen to make himself a cup of strong coffee. Carefully examining the piece of fabric in his hands, he remembered when he first saw it. Chloe, is this some kind of rag? He asked, noticing the piece of fabric in the dresser drawer when he was looking for his jeans. No, of course not. This is the most precious thing I have, she exclaimed, entering the bedroom and seeing what her husband was asking about. Literally swooping down to him, she snatched the piece of fabric from Nicholas's hands and, for a moment, closed her eyes, pressing it to herself. Maybe you'll tell me why it means so much to you, he asked, sitting on the edge of the bed. You know, I grew up in an orphanage and don't know who my parents are. Well, yes, of course. So... The staff at the orphanage found me on the doorstep wrapped in a pink blanket, and this piece of fabric is the only reminder of my past and how I came into this world. Perhaps someday this piece will help me find my relatives. Look, here are some initials. Maybe they belong to my mother. Chloe said with a trembling voice, pointing to two large letters, A and V. Do you really want this? They abandoned you when you were just a baby. I think there is no point in looking for people who didn't need you, Nicholas negatively responded to Chloe's desire to find her parents. I believe it makes no sense. You know, in a way you're right. But it's unfair to judge harshly without knowing what exactly prompted people to do such a thing. Maybe they just didn't love me, or maybe they were forced to do so, thinking I'd be better off elsewhere. I'm not entitled to judge without knowing their motives. And I would most like to meet them, Chloe replied, almost crying. For her, it was indeed important. And only now, after being married for many years, Nicholas understood how much his wife wanted to find her father and mother. He remembered they even tried to do it, reaching out to various authorities but they never managed to find any traces leading to Chloe's relatives. The next morning, entrusting Zoe to the neighbor, Nicholas went to the cemetery to visit his late wife's grave. Finding himself in this gloomy place, creating a depressing atmosphere, he sat down on a bench near the monument with Chloe's photograph. Gazing into her tender blue eyes, he still felt warm feelings, the desire to be with his beloved. Unfortunately, that was no longer possible, his wife couldn't be brought back, and time couldn't be rewound. Just one moment, one extra step on the pedestrian crossing at the wrong time, and Chloe's life was cut short. Nicholas still felt a sense of guilt because he could have come earlier, 
could have picked her up from work and taken her home. But, alas, he didn't. I think I found something that could learn about your past and shed light on the mystery of your birth, Nicholas muttered, once again looking closely at the photo of his late spouse. As he held the piece of fabric in his hands, he constantly looked at the initials and the four-leaf clover, stroking them with his fingers. It seemed impossible, and he couldn't believe it, but he firmly understood that such coincidences don't happen. The fabric was too similar, and the pattern with the image was identical. It seemed as if someone was putting their stamp, a so-called mark, that couldn't be mistaken or forged. I don't know what to do. Is it even worth looking for traces of your past? Nicholas began to doubt aloud, realizing that Chloe was never coming back. He didn't know if he should try to find the old lady who sold him the doll. Should I talk to her about all this and ask in detail where the fabric from which the doll's dress was sewn came from? Maybe she just happened to have it, he continued to speculate, realizing that he might scare the old lady who knew nothing about Chloe or the symbols hidden on the back of the dress. Spending more than an hour at the cemetery, Nicholas asked himself more than one question, trying to understand if he should take any action in this situation. Chloe always supported him and, despite her lack of education, could give quite wise advice on life. Now she wasn't around, and it was hard for Nicholas to make any decisions. After all, he wanted to understand what the consequences would be. Yes, and was it worth doing anything at all? Realizing that he needed to talk about it and discuss this situation with someone, Nicholas headed home. Dylan probably couldn't understand the complexity of it all, so he decided to talk to Naomi. After all, she was older and much wiser than he was. Can we talk alone? Nicholas asked, hoping that the neighbor would help him solve the difficult situation he found himself in. Yes, of course. Is something wrong? You look pale as a sheet, Naomi replied, seeing a pale man standing in front of her, struggling to gather his words. Here, look. Aren't they similar? He began, showing the doll's dress and the piece of fabric that was kept in his wife's dresser drawer. Yes, very similar, especially the pattern and the initials. Probably, it's the work of the same craftsman, confirmed the neighbor Nicholas's assumptions. That's what I think. Only this piece of fabric is the remaining part of Chloe's swaddle, in which she was found on the doorstep of the shelter. And this is the dress of the doll I bought for Zoe on the road. Are you saying that this saleswoman has some connection to your wife? I don't know. I wanted to ask you for advice to understand what to do next. Maybe she can help find Chloe's mother, whom she's never seen. Or maybe it's just a coincidence, and the fabric accidentally ended up with her. I don't understand what to think and what to do now, Nicholas replied, confused. Oh, Nicholas, it's all so complicated. I don't know, maybe there was a connection, maybe not. But I'm sure the patterns are the same. It's clearly the hand of a master, and it's like the signature of a person who left their initials here. It's not my business, of course, but I think everything needs to be clarified, Naomi replied, advising not to torture oneself with guesses, but to get to the bottom of it all once and for all, to find out the truth. Yes, you're probably right. I'll go crazy if I don't figure out whether this woman has any connection to Chloe. Do you remember her name? Naomi asked. It seems like Victoria, something like that, Nicholas answered uncertainly. Well, the name might match, the neighbor replied, pointing out that there was a big letter V on the fabric and dress. Nicholas nodded, delving even deeper into his thoughts. Contemplating the correctness of his decision, he firmly decided that he wanted to find Victoria and ask her personally if she had any connection to Chloe, who was abandoned on the doorstep of the orphanage shortly after birth. You should go tomorrow, for now, take a rest. 
You need to calm down and think everything over again carefully, the neighbor advised, also suggesting that Nicholas leave the keys to the apartment so she could look after Zoe in his absence. Agreeing, he immediately handed over the spare keys and, taking his daughter, went for a walk in the park. Trying to spend more time with Zoe, he couldn't shake off the perplexing situation that had arisen, with too much left unclear. In the evening, after putting his daughter to bed, Nicholas tried to sleep earlier, but his thoughts kept him awake until almost midnight. I'm heading out. Hopefully, I can shed some light on this situation and figure everything out, Nicholas said excitedly to the neighbor in the morning, preparing to go to the village where he bought the doll. All right, good luck to you. I hope everything works out for you, Naomi supported him, crossing him before letting him go. Realizing that he couldn't talk to anyone else about all this, Nicholas got into his car and headed to the village. After a few hours, familiar half-empty streets and familiar houses began to surround him. Remembering where Victoria lived, he immediately headed to her house. Finding himself under her windows, he called out to the owner in the hope that she would answer, but it didn't happen. Peeking inside through a slightly open curtain from one of the windows, Nicholas saw that the house was empty. She's probably still at the market, he thought and wasted no time, heading to the other grandmothers selling along the highway. Hello, could you tell me where to find Victoria? Nicholas asked several familiar vendors, selling pastries and other homemade goods. Hello, son. She's sitting a bit further today. Drive along the road, and you'll notice her right away, one of them replied, pointing in the direction. Thanking them for their help, Nicholas set off. And within a few minutes, indeed, he noticed her and pulled up next to her. Good afternoon. Do you remember me? I bought a handmade doll from you, dressed in light pink with lace. Hello. Yes, I remember. Is something wrong? Victoria asked, realizing that he wouldn't have come to her if the toy hadn't pleased the child. No, no, everything is fine with that. My daughter loved it, but I need to talk to you privately. Is that possible? Nicholas asked, looking around and noticing that there were too many unnecessary people around who shouldn't hear their private conversation. What do you want to talk about? The old woman asked, slightly alarmed, not understanding what the conversation could be about and not trusting the unfamiliar man. I'd like to inquire about something, he replied, taking out a piece of pink fabric with a four-leaf clover and two large initials from his pocket. Will you give me a ride? Victoria asked in a trembling voice, seeing what the buyer was holding in his hands. Clearly recognizing her work, she almost cried but held back to avoid attracting attention. Nicholas nodded approvingly and helped her gather her things. On the way to her house, the woman was literally trembling with excitement as if she wanted to confide but didn't do so until they were behind closed doors. Come in, take a seat, she said, waving her hand towards the kitchen. Dropping her things and toys on the couch, Victoria returned to him and sat down beside him. So, are you going to tell me something? The guest asked again, placing a piece of pink fabric on the table. Where did you get this? Who gave it to you? Victoria asked, barely holding back tears, grabbing the piece of fabric and clutching it tightly to herself. This fabric belongs to my wife, Chloe. She grew up in an orphanage, and that's where we first met, started dating, and eventually got married. This scrap is part of what she was found in on the doorstep of the orphanage 30 years ago. She was left to fate, but the director took care of her as if she were her own daughter. Chloe became the soul of the company, she had plenty of friends, and then we met, falling in love at first sight, Nicholas began to tell, seeing the change in the host's face, listening carefully to every word. You have children, I assume? Victoria asked, making an assumption based on what Nicholas bought from her. 
Yes, Zoe, she'll be sick soon. She adores your doll. From the first day, Sophia, that's what she named her, became my daughter's favorite toy. Then why did you come alone? Doesn't Chloe want to see me? Wiping away tears, Victoria asked, realizing that her daughter might not forgive her for being abandoned on the doorstep of the orphanage. Unfortunately, that's physically impossible. A few years ago, there was a tragic accident, and Chloe is no longer with us. I'm raising our daughter alone, but she doesn't need to know about our conversation at all. She's still too young for all of this, Nicholas said sadly. Upon hearing that her daughter was no longer alive, Victoria couldn't hold back and burst into tears. She couldn't contain her emotions anymore, and the pain from what she heard prevented her from saying a word. Seeing that she was truly upset, Nicholas tried to calm her down and helped her find heart drops to regain composure. I'm so foolish. I've hated myself all my life for what I did, she muttered, wiping away tears. Maybe you'll tell me about it? Nicholas asked, wanting to make sure that he understood everything correctly and that the woman sitting in front of him was Chloe's mother. I've spent almost my entire life in this village. But like any girl, I dreamed of living in a big city. After school, I managed to escape from this backwater, and I even completed sewing courses. It allowed me to get a job at a sewing factory and rent a room in a nearby dormitory. Gradually, I got used to life in the city, but something happened that changed my life. Meeting and getting to know the driver from the same factory led to me falling in love with him, and we started dating. Some time later, I found out that I was pregnant and told him about it. I thought he would be happy since he swore to love me forever. But after this news, he just ran away. I don't know where he is or if he's even alive. I haven't seen him since that day. It was too late to get rid of the child, and I would never have dared to do that anyway. I wanted to return home to the village, but I was afraid of gossip. Honestly, I'm not sure if my parents would have let me in with a child on the doorstep. Soon I gave birth, but I had no money or means to support the girl. So I just had to leave her in the orphanage. Several years later, I got married, and my husband and I tried to find our daughter. It didn't work out. We never had children in our marriage, and after my husband passed away, I've been living alone for 15 years, Victoria cried again, recounting the story of her difficult fate, during which she faced many trials and difficulties. Well, I sympathize, Nicholas said sincerely, somewhat understanding why she had to do what she did. He felt that she was telling the truth and genuinely regretted everything. Therefore, he couldn't be angry or wish anything bad. At the same time, he felt extremely uncomfortable being around her. After all, it seemed that somehow this person had betrayed Chloe by leaving her on the doorstep of the orphanage. Several hours later, Nicholas returned to the city. Sitting behind the wheel of the car, he tried once again to replay the entire conversation with Victoria in his head and reconsider it. Thinking that in the end he did the right thing, Nicholas went up to the apartment meeting Naomi and his daughter. After playing with Zoe for a while, he left her in the living room so she could watch cartoons and distract herself, not interfering with the adult's conversation. Yes, I found her, and we talked about it. Well, is she Chloe's mother or just a coincidence? She's really her mother. Honestly, I expected something like this, but I still don't know what to think and what to do. I don't understand what feelings I should have towards this person. Right now, I'm just angry because it's because of her that Chloe spent her entire childhood in an orphanage and never knew maternal love. On the other hand, there's annoyance and disappointment, maybe even some sympathy. After all, her life didn't turn out well, and now she's completely alone, abandoned by everyone, you could say. I understand you but I think you need to be kinder to her. 
After all, she's not a stranger. First of all, for Zoe. You have no one else, just the two of you, and I think the appearance of a grandmother is a fortunate coincidence that shouldn't be avoided. Besides, if Chloe hadn't ended up in the orphanage, you wouldn't have met. Yes, I'm not sure it's a good idea after all. We're used to relying only on ourselves, and besides, you're always there. Well, I'm not eternal. Moreover, I'm just a neighbor, while she's a blood relative. Don't worry, talk about it with Zoe. She's still little, but she's very smart. You need to discuss this and listen to her opinion. If the little one is against it, then it's your decision. But if she wants to meet her grandmother, don't stand in the way of that, Naomi advised, understanding that family shouldn't be taken for granted to avoid spending life, including old age, and complete loneliness. Do you really think it's appropriate? After all, she treated Chloe like that. Nicholas replied, doubting whether this advice would be helpful to him. Don't judge a person by one act. We all make mistakes, but that doesn't mean we should pay for them for the rest of our lives. I think she has already regretted her decision many times. And if she could, she would change everything, the neighbor replied, insisting that he talk to his daughter. Okay, I understand you. I'll think about it. Nicholas spent the next few days in contemplation. It turned out that making a decision wasn't so simple. He needed to carefully analyze everything, weighing all the pros and cons. Almost giving up sleep and replacing it with coffee and cigarettes, Nicholas realized that he needed to act in the best interests of Zoe. Zoe, would you like to meet your grandmother? He asked his daughter, hoping to support her in any decision, even if it wasn't pleasant for him. Do I have a grandmother? The girl asked, looking at her father. Yes, if you want to and don't mind, we can visit her for the weekend. What do you think about that? I'm all for it. Zoe replied cheerfully and enthusiastically. Accepting her decision, Nicholas freed up the weekend from other commitments. On the way to the village, they stopped at the nearest supermarket to buy treats and sweets. Several hours later, Nicholas slowed down near the fallen fence and noticed Victoria digging in the garden nearby. As soon as Nicholas and Zoe got out of the car, she looked up and saw the guests. For a moment, Victoria froze, shocked by Nicholas's appearance on her doorstep. Understanding that she had guests, she began to run around and fuss, trying to do something to improve her home. Hello. I didn't expect you to come back after leaving with a slam of the door. I thought we saw each other for the last time, and I can understand you. And there's a reason to hate me. Don't worry about that. I've thought it all over carefully and realized that I can't treat you this way in memory of Chloe and for the sake of Zoe's future. Chloe never judged you and dreamed of finding her mother. She dreamed of meeting her, of getting to know her, Nicholas replied, politely explaining his decision and hugging the woman, who was barely holding back tears. Meanwhile, Zoe, clearly feeling uncomfortable with a stranger, hid behind her dad, only peeking cautiously at Victoria. Hi, Zoe, my name is Grandma Victoria, she said, trying to introduce herself to her granddaughter. Hello. The girl replied distrustfully, stepping back. Would you like me to show you something? The grandmother asked with a smile on her face, trying to interest Zoe. Yes, she agreed, noticing from her father's expression that he was not against it and was behaving completely calmly, trusting this stranger. Victoria, determined to win Zoe's favor, led the girl to the bedroom and showed her the toys neatly arranged on the bed. Can I play with all of them? Asked Zoe. It was evident that her eyes lit up with excitement and Victoria couldn't refuse her, even if she wanted to. Of course, take them, they're all yours, she replied with a smile, addressing her granddaughter. Hooray! 
shouted the little girl and jumped onto the bed, burying herself in the toys. Meanwhile, the grandmother, deciding not to disturb her, returned to the kitchen, where Nicholas was already waiting for her. Thank you for coming. It's very unexpected, but I'm happy, she said, trying to hold back her emotions as she thanked him for the pleasant surprise. You're welcome. I understand how exciting and important this is for all of us. I spent a lot of time thinking it over and wasn't sure until the end, but one thing I know for sure, it's important to me that my daughter is happy. I see that she's afraid and shy, but Zoe has long dreamed of having a real grandmother. And I think you can give her that. She needs love, attention, and feminine care. I'm doing everything I can, but sometimes work gets in the way, Nicholas explained, sitting on a chair. Yes, I understand. I think Zoe understands this too, because she knows that Daddy needs to earn a living. I hope you're right. I don't know what to say, said Nicholas, pondering. What do you think about moving in with us and helping raise Zoe? Your house is old, but that's not a problem. We can renovate it and sell it. Or we can come here for the whole summer so she can run around outdoors. What do you think? I don't even know what to say to you. I need to think about it, Victoria replied after a moment of pause, shocked by Nicholas's proposal and unsure of what to say. At that moment, Zoe, peeking into the kitchen, approached her grandmother and climbed into her arms, hugging her tightly around the neck. Grandma, I want you to live with us too, said Zoe, who had heard most of the conversation. My dear ones, my lovely ones, Victoria said, tears welling up in her eyes. I agree, she added, accepting her son-in-law and granddaughter's proposal. And soon, the three of them returned to the city together.